Welcome, 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 people. Roz, hello, I'm about to request you. Um, Roz, it's saying that you're, maybe it's the way your account is set up that, um, it's saying you're unable to join. Can you try to request me? When I go to look to get to invite you to join. Are you using your Instagram from your phone? And if so, is it the most recent updated Instagram? If not, you might need to... Um, update your Instagram account. I might need Hollis to help you out with that and maybe we could start with Lisa instead. Um, because I think it's not letting me, yeah, it won't let me request you. Hollis, do you mind reaching out to Roz on Instagram and helping her? Yeah, it can't be on a computer. It has to be on your phone. You have to sign on from your phone in order to do the live. Let me know if you can do that. Hi. Oh, there we go. Yes. Woohoo. Oh, okay. Hey. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I didn't know I couldn't sign on from the computer. It's fine. We got yeah. it. All right. We, we figured it out. Yes. Tech savvy me. <laughs> yes you're you're doing it we're all doing it we're all learning as we go along you know yes. what I'm saying? this is a a new climate a new world so um as we as we do this we're figuring it out let me begin with um kind of just describing to everyone what is going on so welcome everybody welcome 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 thank you for joining on this live um, my name is Aja Monet. I'm a poet and organizer. Um, and I am so honored to be hosting these series. Voices is an interdisciplinary performance arts project and campaign grounded in Black women's stories um, by the day to unify the vision of ending violence against women, cis women, trans women, and non-binary people across the African continent and African diaspora. Our goal is to use art to embody and inspire solidarity making in our collective imagination. This is the virtual listening tour currently live on Instagram. And the whole purpose of this is to encourage um, Black women to engage in conversation with each other and for others who wish to be in solidarity with us to listen actively and radically um, so that we can imagine and start to create the world we want to see. Artists are the greatest visionaries of our, uh, any social movement and help to push and catapult us into the, into the uh, collective imagination that we need for every pressing time. And so um, today, I'm so honored to have two guests, but the first guest is um, Rosalind D. Smith. <laughs> and Roz, 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 and she is um, the Beyond Incarceration Program Manager for V-Day. Um, she is using her personal experience from long-term incarceration as a vehicle for her work as a criminal justice reform advocate. Roz uh, obtained her bachelor's degree 
while incarcerated, created curriculum and taught parenting classes for and with other mothers in prison. She has also been featured in a documentary film called What I Want My Words to Do to You from a writing workshop at the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women conducted and led by the playwright and author V, formerly Eve Ensler. Um, since her release after serving 39 years, she's devoted her time between her daughter and her advocacy work. Welcome, Roz. Thank you for having me. I am honored to be here. I am honored to be in your presence. I'm honored to be on V-Day staff. I'm just feeling really good about my life right now. That means so much to me. And um, I'm grateful to learn from you and with you, to be working with you. And I'm looking forward to more that we will get to do together um, through, this, through this work and through V-Day. So I wanted to start by um, I want you to feel comfortable. I don't want you to feel too much pressure. I know that you're nervous. So yeah. everyone, please. I'm a little nervous. I, everyone, uh, please show love and compassion <laughs> and tell your peoples to come listen to our sister because Roz, um, I'm sure you have a word for us. So more than anything, I just wanted to ask you, like, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? I actually wanted to be a nurse. I always, as a young child, I always had animals, and I always used to take care of animals. And um, my great-grandmother raised me, and we used to save cats that were stray, birds that fell out the tree. We were always nursing them back to health. And one thing that she always told me that always stuck with me, too, is that because um, anything I had, I wanted to take care of, I wanted to keep, I wanted to own. And she was like, that is not the purpose of it, Ronnie, because she called me Ronnie. And she used to say that, you know, we'll help the animal get better. We'll take care of it, but they need to be free. And it hurted me so much because I wanted to just keep everything that, that we took care of. And I learned a great lesson from that. Like, you know, um, I didn't have to own anything. I was enough already. I didn't have to own people. I didn't have to own things. I didn't have to have those attachments. I could love something and give it love and release it and let it go and be all right with it. And she taught me that in life. Mm, that's a beautiful lesson to learn. And so coming from that dream of wanting to be a nurse, what led you to where you are now? You don't need to get into details. But what are some of the challenges and the struggles that you've had to learn and work through in yourself to get to the woman you are now? A writer, um, a, an organizer, someone that's working with, with Black women in prison. What are some of the, 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 the characteristics that you had to work through in yourself to get to where you are now? The main thing that I had to work through was loving myself. Because growing up, the world had taught me that it didn't care about me. I wasn't important. You know, when I got sentenced to 50 years to life, I had 50 years to life. I was sentenced at 17 years old. And that message right there told me that I was expendable. I didn't matter to anybody. Nobody cared about me. I was just, I was a throwaway. Um, growing up with my mother, I didn't know my mother until I was 11 years old. My grandmother raised me. My great-grandmother raised me. My mother was a heroin addict, and um, she couldn't function. She had six children, and she didn't function very well because of the things that she was going through, the challenges that she had to experience in life. Her mother died when she was very young. She um, was raised in a church environment, but she wanted to break away from that, and she got married. The guy who married her ended up taking all of her money and leaving her. And her life just spiraled into despair. So when I got to finally meet her, she was involved in a relationship, not with my father, but with someone else. And she was very abusive and neglective to us as children. Um, that alone going from an environment of love to an environment of neglect and abuse really jarred me. 
and I started hanging out on the streets a lot. I wanted to get away. I felt I wasn't loved. This was the, another message. I felt I wasn't loved. I felt I wasn't needed. And all of this compounded. And when I got in trouble and I um, was arrested, it just kept going. It's just like this, this weight on my shoulders just kept going and going and going. And I didn't know how to release it. I didn't know. I just felt like the world was coming down on me every which way, from home, from society, from every corner. And um, I had to learn how to love myself. And that took a lot of time. And there were plenty of women that I met, older women that I met when I was, went to prison that um, nurtured me and loved me and told me I was wonderful and then I was beautiful and now I could achieve anything that I wanted to do. And um, that helped me. It took a long time, though. It, it wasn't something that came overnight. It took years for me to really love myself and believe in myself and know that I was worthy. And these are the messages that society sends to a lot of black and brown women and girls, you know, in our school systems, in just the way that we are raised, in the things that are happening in the world now with everybody just, you know, derogatory images of women you know we always have to use our sexuality to get ahead and that's not true and all of these things compound on young women and they don't believe in their self they think that they need to you know show their butts or show their titties or have sex or um be involved with somebody and have a baby by a basketball player or a football player or a movie star you know and these are the wrong images that society is teaching us when you talked about some of the older women in prison that you met that were able to, to help you, to show you, what are some of the ways that they, sh let's shout them out. Who are some of the women? Kathy Bodine, <laughs> the main ones, Betty Gail Tyson, um, Cheryl Wilkins. Um, there was a Dolly Mapp was there. Um, Sheila Darton, it was so many of them. They just like, they really embraced me because I, I didn't have a sense of self-worth. And they told me, they encouraged me to go to school. Um, Kathy, more than anybody, encouraged me to write. And that's how I got into um, Eve's writing workshop because she told me, you know, you could write, you're a poet. Um, Judith Clark was also a mentor of mine. Um, it, it's so many. I can't even remember all of them. But throughout the years that I was in prison, you know, it was so many. And what I learned from that is to build community and build strength in, in our place that we were at. And um, we shared love. We shared joy. We shared tears. We shared tragic events. It was so many things that we did in there. And Sister Elaine Roulette, she was another one. God bless her soul. But um, she helped me a lot. You know, um, I, w I was just blessed. I just feel like I was blessed. And despite the fact that I, I did so many years, the experience that I had, I don't look at the negative things of because prison is a horrible place. And I don't want people to feel like prison is some place where you could go and, you know, find yourself or anything because you're separated from your family. You're separated from your, your children. You're separated from life, you know, but at the end of the day, these women that were in there, we created this community of love and friendship and we helped each other grow in ways that I feel like, would have never happened for me if I wasn't there. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, so I, have you ever read this piece? I thought about it um, while preparing for this talk. There's a piece, sorry, let me put my little head wrap situation on. It was coming off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was I was trying to, to think of things to obviously bring up in co conversation. And I don't know if you've ever read this piece by Asada Shakur, How It Is With Us. No. I'm going to send it to you because nope. I think maybe it'll relate to you. But um, she talks a lot about how most, most women locked up don't know what feminism is, right? They have no idea 
of what that is as a term. Um, I'm trying to see where the actual line is that she she talked about it. Um, she said, there is no connection between the women's movement and lesbianism. Most of the women at Rikers Island have no idea what feminism is, let alone lesbianism. Feminism, the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement are worlds away from women at Rikers. The black liberation struggle is equally removed from the lives of women at Rikers. While they verbalize acute recognition that America is a racist country where the poor are treated like dirt, they nevertheless feel responsible for the filth of their lives. The, the air at Rikers is permeated with self-hatred. Many women bear marks on their arms, legs, and wrists from suicide attempts or self-mutilation. They speak about themselves in self-deprecating terms. They consider themselves failures. While most women contend that whitey is responsible for their oppression, they do not examine the cause or source of that oppression. There is no sense of class struggle. Do you feel like that re still relates to, to, yes. to your experience? This was written very yes. long time it's ago. It's still relevant today. It's relevant today. And the, um, the sad thing about it is that it is... It was, and it will continue to be until we educate. Like, I was fortunate enough to have um, Kathy and Judy there teaching me, you know, about the movement. And although they did teach me, it wasn't something that I, I grasped until I came home. And what I'm learning now, I'm re-educating myself about my history, about the movement, about feminism, you know, and these things, I've, I kind of beat myself up sometimes because I was like, yeah, you should have been doing all of this while you were inside. But I had so many other things going on, so many other issues dealing with my self-esteem and myself that I had to tackle those first. I had to tackle those to understand who I was and what I wanted to be. Because when I first came to prison, I, I was numb. I, I, I numb myself with drugs. I numb myself with not just not being. I felt like my life was over and ended and I didn't want to do anything. And these are the women that from on a daily basis like would come to me and tell me, you know, let's get involved with this. Let's go to poetry class. Let's do this. Let's do that. You know, you can write, go to school, get your education. Life doesn't end here. And it's sad, but um, if it wasn't for them, I, I wouldn't be the woman I am today. You know, well, what I was your first poem? My first poem. Oh, gosh, that was so long ago. But the funny thing about it is that I wrote poetry when I was living with my mother because it was the only way that I could express what I was feeling. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. So I wrote poems and I used to put them under my bed about what was going on with me, what I was feeling, how I was growing, who I was, you know, thinking about at the time. Okay. And then what made you pick it back up while you were... Oh, somebody called me. It's so... I always love... I always love words. For some reason, words just resonate with my soul and... I can't really explain it. It's just like I feel at home writing. I feel like home reading. I feel like home when I write poetry, when I'm thinking about poetry, when I want to express myself and, and just let, let go and let people know exactly what I'm feeling. So it, writing has always been a way for me to, to be free. And what, who are some of your favorite writers that spoke to you? when you would get down or when you would think about things, what are, what are poets or songs or art that would move you and get you out of a funk? Gwendolyn Brooks growing up, we real cool. I, I loved that. And I loved um, Robert Frost, the road not taken. I used to always read that over. There's a, a line of poetry and, um, I used to say this when I was a kid all the time, and I still don't remember where it came from, but I want to die like a lamb on a log. And I used to say that over and over when um, my sister and I were in the NAACP and we were doing drama class, and I would always just, you know, get really dramatic and say, oh, I want to die like a lamb on a log. Um, Nikki Giovanni, um, Sonia Sanchez, you know, these are people that later on in life Kathy and Judy and them introduced me to. So, you know, um, 
Yeah. That's beautiful. What do you think about abolishing prisons? And would you ever, would you, did you know that there was a movement, there were people working to abolish prisons outside when you were no. locked up? And then what, is it, what does it feel like to hear that currently being a mantra in the movement right now? So inside, like I said, I was so focused on trying to get my head together, myself together, that I really didn't know that this was going on, that so many women and individuals and people that were formerly incarcerated and that were not incarcerated were doing like such amazing work to try to end mass incarceration. I was so clueless. And when I came home and I saw all these organizations and these nonprofits and, and a lot of them originated from formerly incarcerated people, I was like blown away. I was like, oh my God, I, I never knew this, you know, and it, it blew my wig. <laughs> it really did. But um, they work harder than anybody in this movement. And um, I'm just amazed and I'm happy to be a part of this movement now. And not for nothing, if it wasn't for V, I probably would have went in another direction. You know, coming home was really hard for me and not understanding life on the, on the other side of the fence. Because in prison, like, they tell you to do everything. They tell you when to go to the bathroom, when to eat, when to wake up when to go to sleep when to go to program when you could go to school and um i had these ideas that when i came home i was going to put prison behind me i didn't want to have anything to do with it i was just so traumatized by everything that um i thought i was going to get a job i signed up for um to do real estate i was going to be a real estate agent i went and took the test when they asked me about my criminal history, it came back, they denied me. That went out the window. Looking for housing, criminal background check, got denied. That went out the window. So um, this history of incarceration is something that you really can't shake off in this world out here because it follows you wherever you go. And Eve opened up a platform for me to do the work from my experience, from my lived experience and created a space for me to thrive. And I will always forever be grateful for her for that because I don't think if it wasn't for her and organizations that hire formerly incarcerated people we would be just left in the streets. We would be homeless. Yeah. Well, shout out to V um, and V Day for the work that they're doing. What is something that has um, inspired you, you know, in reflection and in retrospect about the women that are formerly incarcerated and the women who are locked up? Like, what are some, what is some of the work that you see um, happening on the inside um, because I think we don't, we have a narrative of, you know, the relationship between black women is already scarred and already, you know, hindered, right? Um, but I think that we don't talk enough about black women in prison and what black women's struggles are in prison. I remember seeing a, a documentary that if you get a chance, I'm going to send it to you. It's um, called Time and it's about this oh, sister. Yeah. I yeah. know. I know. Yeah. And so she she um her story is so powerful and and one of the the brothers had asked uh, you know an artist that i know that was an interview with her asked like do men show up uh, do do men show up for women in prison as much as women show up for men right um and i think we know the answer to that but i think there has to be a real cultural shift in the narratives which is why i'm glad that you're writing and you're in the world but what are some of the the work? What is some of the work from Black women that you see that is happening around prison, um, you know, abolition, um, and reimagining kind of the ways that we deal with um, transformational justice and restorative justice? I, I'm interested to hear. Well, um, when I when I first came home, I was um, working with um, 
the Center for Justice at Columbia with Cheryl Wilkins and Kathy. And they are doing amazing, amazing work. They create space in Columbia University that I just can't imagine how they did it. You know, they embraced them. They have the um, Women's Initiative Collective. I was a part of that. And we learned so much about women's history. I had an opportunity to meet Barbara Smith. I had an opportunity to um, engage in um, campaign with um, campaign writing, how to, how to create a campaign. I got to meet Angela Davis and she took us on a tour and she gave us a lecture. I mean, these are the things that these women are doing and incorporating other formerly incarcerated women going inside the prisons. Well, now because of COVID, it's, it's very hard for us to get in there, but going inside the prisons and um, just giving that information and, and helping the women out. We um, recently with V-Day, we started a, a writing workshop with women inside and formerly incarcerated women on the outside. And um, the National Council for Women with um, is an amazing organization that are doing wonderful things. Um, it's just so many. It's so, it really blows my mind because there's so many of them that are doing powerful things to end mass incarceration, especially for women and girls. You know, we are really forgotten in this mass incarceration pool. There's a lot of programs. There's a lot of hype about the men, the men, the men, the men. But the women, are. we suffer in silence. You know, we're there for our men, but our men are never there for us. In the visiting room in um, Bedford Hills, you would see aunties, grandmas, sisters, cousins, but you wouldn't see men. It was very few men that would come up there and stick with their women. If women were in relationships with men before they came to prison or women got arrested because of the man in their life, they weren't supported. The only ones that came up there were their mothers, their children, their aunties, their sisters, you know, and, and it was sad. But you see the men's prisons and the men's prisons are filled with women on those buses every freaking week every week crowded buses you know making it to go up there and um we are forgotten and that's why that's part of what i want to do with this writing to heal workshop is to bring the voices of women to the forefront to tell our stories in our words what is the first thing you did when you got home Learn to how to, how to use a kiosk. I didn't know how to use use a kiosk. <laughs> I I mean, you don't understand. Like after so many years in prison, we didn't have um technology in there. We we didn't have any access to it at all. And when I first came home, I didn't even know how to swipe a metro card because when I left, I was using tokens. Tokens. I remember the little tokens with the hole in the middle. <laughs> so, I didn't know how to swipe a, a, um, a Metro card. I didn't know how to use a phone. The first thing I did, I wanted a phone so bad. I was just pressing on all these buttons and everything. I ended up jamming the phone up. I had to go. I spent three hours in T-Mobile with my phone because I had to I had to get a whole new phone. I, I didn't know what I did to it. But um, I'm glad to say that I'm becoming more tech savvy. And um, it's still a lot of things in this world that I don't get from being in prison for so long. But um, I'm learning. I feel like I'm reborn. I have to learn so much. I have to learn so much about life because prison stagnates you in a way. You know, I um, inside... You kind of feel like a child because everything is dictated for you, what you have to do, when you have to do it. And um, now that I have the freedom, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm scared. Sometimes I'm scared to go outside by myself. Sometimes I'm scared to take the train by myself. And people don't realize this, and I don't tell everybody this, but I have a lot of fears with that. Yeah, there's a lot of problems. I imagine there's a lot of PTSD or depression from I'm 
I didn't hear can you. Can you hear me? I don't know if we got stuck. No. Now um, I can hear you. I said, I imagine there is PS PTSD that a lot of people come back home with a lot of depression. And, you know, um, that's why a lot of people get back into drugs or bad habits or do certain things because we don't create the sort of society that welcomes folks home. Um, before we close out and get Lisa in, I wanted to say thank you. And I wanted to ask you one more question. Um, what is one of the biggest goals and dreams you hope to accomplish with your words and with your writing and your art? It's to change the way that we look at women, to change the paradigm of this woman. Women are the caretakers of every. We are vulnerable. Sometimes we are weak. We need somebody to hold us up sometimes. But the weight of black women, the weight on black women's shoulders is so much and so heavy of a burden. You know, and I, I want to change that. I look forward to helping you change that. You are not alone. <laughs> um, I want to thank you for giving us your time. That wasn't so bad, was it? No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I look forward to the first Rosalind Smith poetry book. That's right. <laughs> published coming soon, hopefully. The right to Heal. All of yes. our five women are going to be involved in that. We're going to lift up everybody's voices and tell our stories. Yes. So I want everyone to please go follow Roz right now. Make sure you follow and support her. You'll hear more with V-Day. We're going to have way more going on. Please let folks you know who are working inside to reach out to Roz. She's trying to do so much work to get women's voices out on the outside and also to support women who are on the inside. Um, I appreciate you and I value you for your time, Roz. And I'm just so grateful to be on this platform with you. I'm grateful to be here with you doing this where you inspire me. You my no, motivation. Inspire me. You, you my motivation for okay. getting up. <laughs> <laughs> I accept that. I accept it. Yeah, accept it. Hold on to it. Take a compliment and let it sit for a That's little bit. Right. Feel right. it. Feel it in your body. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right, that feels okay. good. I, I'm, I'm so much gratitude, and let's, um, yeah, we'll see. I'll speak, speak to you soon. Okay. Good night, everybody. All right. Um, thanks so much, Roz. That was beautiful. I'm so glad that she got to join. And now, Lisa. Hopefully, you're here still, somewhere. Yes. Okay. I'm going to send you a request now. Ah, <laughs> what's up, sis? Hey. <laughs> wow, that was really powerful. Powerful, powerful. Right? Um, yeah. Roz is doing incredible work and it's always really jarring just to hear um, just how much our black, the black women who are in prison and also who come home are left behind in the narrative around mass incarceration. But before we kind of get into that conversation, I just want to welcome you and say thank you for joining us. Um, to those of you who are just joining, um, Voices is a new interdisciplinary project. Um, it's an art piece and a campaign by V-Day um, for Black women to tell our stories and reimagine the world we want to live in, um, to practice solidarity with one another, and to also demonstrate for others who are listening how to radically listen and show up in support. Um, and so we're doing this virtual listening tour, which is a part of getting others to listen to Black women and to learn uh, what, what makes them you know, tick, what, what inspires their voices, how they've used their voices to impact the world um, and their communities. So joining us right now is uh, Lisa Jessie Peterson. She's an artivist, an actress, playwright, author, poet. Her critically acclaimed one woman show, The Peculiar Patriot is available on Audible, was nominated for a Drama Desk Award and is a recipient 
of the prestigious Art for Justice Fund grant. Lisa performed the Peculiar Patriot in 35 prisons across, whoo, across the country and recently performed it at Angola State Penitentiary in Louisiana, which is currently in development for a documentary. Lisa is an author of All Day, A Year of Love and Survival Teaching Incarcerated Kids at Rikers Island, which is being developed for TV. And she was featured in Ava DuVernay's The 13th and was a consultant on Bill Moore's documentary, Rikers. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Jesse Peterson. Thank you, sis. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for creating this space. You, you, you're really creating amazing spaces. So I'm just grateful to be part of your orbit. Ah, we in the orbit together, but I yes. am honored to, to witness and to be a fan of yours and to see the work that you've done in the world. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of start off the jump, like, why poetry? When did you first fall in love with poetry? What was, what was it about poetry instead of any, you could have been doing anything else in the world. Why poetry? You know, um, poetry was something that I stumbled into. Well, I won't say I stumbled into, but um, I didn't give myself permission to call myself a poet. I didn't think I was a writer or a poet, um, but I always wrote in my journal. My journal was my, um, was my therapy, was my way to have a conversation with God. And, you know, I, I, broke up with this dude and he broke my heart and you know I wrote in my journal and I shared the journal entry what I thought was a journal entry with my best friend who's a poet uh Sonia San and um she said girl that's a poem I said no girl this is just a journal entry this this you know this nigga done broke my heart girl you know so I'm just lamenting right and she goes girl no that's a poem you have to go to the New York and, and read it Unbeknownst to me, I lived three blocks away from the New Yorkian because I was living on the Lower East Side um, in Alphabet City between C and D, between Coke and Dope. Ooh. And um, it, literally. You and um, yeah, 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 yeah. In, in the Wild Wild West days. And so I literally went um, to the New Yorkian and I read what I thought was just a journal entry, but she convinced me it was a poem and it was received. And so that was my start of um, trusting my work, trusting my word, trusting that, you know, what I wrote on the page had um, had some kind of resonance beyond just me reading it for myself. So that was that was the start. Um, and then I just literally just started gobbling up um, Shakespeare, Sumi Sanchez and Mary Baraka, um, the last poets. And so that just th that was my. My, my my daily bread mm. and, and and that's how my poet got wings wow i know that you know the new yorican is such a legendary um place for so many of us and oh, especially yeah. being with post-covid this has transformed everything for those of us who are performers and used to kind of being able to be in community with each other um, and so I've been doing a lot of reminiscing of looking back and the, the, the honor it was to be among so many legends over the years, having sat at the feet and drank from all these incredible poets. And I wanted to ask you, like, who are some of the most um, iconic and memorable um, performers that you got to perform with and, and witness? Um, and what did what lessons did they leave you over the years? Was there ever a, a, a word of wisdom that they gave you that helped carry you through difficult times? Ooh, um, that, that's, that's, that's a long list. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, the, the, the two that really um, stand out for me just because I have personal relationships with them is um, Abi Odun from The Last Poets. Um, he literally took me under his wing. And, and, and Sonia Sanchez, you know, uh, Mama Sonia. Um, and, you know, and, and also, and also too, um, and I performed with um, Amir Baraka. And I'll never forget something, um, we were in rehearsal with uh, Craig Harris and Amir Baraka, and we, you know, we're in rehearsal studio. And I'm just kind of like in awe that I'm like, you know, in this jam session rehearsing with Amir Baraka and, and, and Craig Harris. And Amir Baraka, he said, you know, um, he would always say, how's your blade? 
Like now how you do, but how's your blade? Because for Ooh. him, your art is your is your blade. That's your weapon. So when he was saying, you know, you know, you know, keep keep your blade sharp, keep your art sharp, you know. And so um I I I just always remember like, wow, like art being a being your weapon, art being your blade and keeping it sharp. Um, so that's something that um, you know, Baba Amiri has left with me. And and Dune is is just always, you know, about speaking your truth, um, speaking truth to power. And and, and Mama Sonia is is all about is, is all about the for me is, is the medicine. You know, she's such a she's such a profound, you know, high priestess and, and medicine woman. Um and so I, I just the, the the her sound, her tone and and how she stirs, you know, with her voice. There, there's something very powerful in, in, in the magic of 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 her um of her repetition, of, of her chanting, of her, you know, when she does her, her calls, you know, it just stirs something. And, and for me, that's so um, um, in, instructive about tapping into my, my woman power, my, my own, finding my own howl. How do I howl? You know, because our howling can heal. And that was actually the name of my first one woman show, Kieran's Home Girl Healer Howls. And so, I, you know, I, I can only think that and, and credit that to, to Mama Sonia and, and other other artists too, but I don't know, there's something real medicinal with with, with women how. Mm. Woo. Well, many people might not know, but um I was watching an interview of you and you were talking about how you started with, with Rikers and that you had gotten this teaching artist gig and then you ended up going to to you know, Island Academy or whatever, and it ended up being at Rikers Island and you kind of not even really being aware that that was where it was going to be. And um, as someone who has worked also teaching um, th those of our brothers and our, and, our, and our folks that are locked up behind bars, I know that there's so many, um, there's so many painful moments, also beautiful moments. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a real struggle to witness our folks literally going through this kind of intentional slave system that is existing. Um, but I wanted to ask you as a teacher, as a teaching artist, as someone that walks in knowing that you are about to feed people, you know, um, in many ways, things that they, they need for nourishment to keep them going during, during some of the hardest and most, you know, visceral moments in being locked up. What was one of the greatest transformations that you witnessed while teaching? And uh, behind bars, like what was, what was a moment or a story um, where you witnessed a, a, a poet or a poem or a piece or or art transform or change um, the relationship between you and your students and their in themselves? Well, I have I have so many. Um, uh, the the first one comes to mind is is my little brother uh, Tariq. He was sixteen and. Um, he was he was brooding, you know. He was real quiet, um, real sullen, and um, and so he was writing. You know, I was doing my poetry. You know, I'm 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 like you know I'm thinking I'm the cool poetry lady, and, and he was writing, and um, and and so I was reading over his shoulder because that's one of the things I do. You know, I walk around the classroom. You know, I read over their shoulders, and you know, I give them. You know, I try and speak life into them, like you know, like yeah, 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 that's dope. You got that. You know, like keep going, keep going to kind of give them that encouragement to keep writing, no matter you know, no matter what it looks like on the page, right? But just to keep them, uh, keeping that valve open. And he was like, I, I never forget, he was like, um, he was like, miss, he was like, I, I don't even know why I'm doing this. He was like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going upstate and I'm, I'm a felon. A ain't, ain't no hope for me. And, and, and he, and it was so heavy and he was so, he had already resigned himself like, it's done. My life is over. I'm a felon. I'm going upstate at 16, at 16 years old. And I'll never forget. Um, and, and, and the poet, and, and he didn't think he was writing poetry. He was just like writing on the page. He was like, I'm not even a poet. I'm not a poet. And it was just so powerful. It was so um, heartbreaking. It was so real. And, but there was, but it, it, as dark as his mood was, there was something so, there was a light. I saw a light in him. And um, I just remember encouraging him 
to, to, to keep going. And I was like, your, your words are so powerful. And one of the things I, I would always do in poetry class is I would, when I would collect their, their writing, I would always read it out loud, but I would never, um, I, I would never say their names. Right. So I would do it anonymously because of course they're terrified. No, don't read mine. Don't read mine. Eye. Right. So I said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to say who wrote it. You know, and of course, when I would get to their poem, I'm, I'm a performer, so I'm gonna put my, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my stank on it, right? I'm gonna make it sound like this, you know, the hottest shit, right? And, and when I read his poem, the crowd was like, "Yo!" The crowd, the, the class, they were like, "Yo, who wrote that? That was dope. That was yo." And I saw something in him, like he, he sat up a little bit more. He was like, "Yo, that was me." And so it created this community where they were validating each other, and I saw a light in him, and I stayed in touch with his grandmother. You know, while he went upstate and then he graduated from um, he came home and he went to a community college. And I went to his graduation um, and I was the loudest one there screaming and I kept in contact with him. And he's always been writing and he's been doing. And, and that was the thing that held him, held him down, got him through when he was upstate was his ability to write. Because when you're writing, you're reading. And if you're reading, you're growing. And that was his lifeline upstate. Wow. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to ask you what have you've been doing this for a long time. Um, and I'm sure there were days when it felt really discouraging, you know, um, that you wondered what could art do? Why even continue? What, what do you tell yourself in the, what did you tell yourself in those moments? And what have you seen art be able to shift culturally in this moment that has transformed what you may have felt in those difficult moments? Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll be really um, transparent. Like when I first started out, I was not a willing participant, meaning I did not go into Rikers Island on some like freedom writing mission. Like this is something I wanted to do to help the community. I was literally going in cause I'm an artist. I was broke. I needed a check. Right. And so this was just for me, it was another gig, right. Another job. So I didn't have that, you know, sense of, Oh, I'm going in here specifically for these young boys and these young girls. Cause I work with the, with, with the adolescents too, you know, my little firecrackers and, um, but it was, it, it was, it, there, there was something so, um, I don't know, like, like um, there was an immediate connection. Um, and, you know, you asked, you know, what, what kept me going on, in, in moments where I didn't feel like going. And I, it, it was really a lyric, uh, or not a lyric, but a comment from, um, from Tupac. And he said, um, he goes, I might not change the world but I want to be the spark in the brain of the one who does. So that, that gave me a charge that when I'm in that classroom, when I'm in that environment, I'm just there to, to spark. And I don't know w which one of these kids is going to be that spark, you know, and another thing, and another, um, you know, uh, um, elder ancestor that kept me going was Malcolm X because I was so, cognizant of his transformation in the belly of the beast. And I always remind myself, I could be standing in front of one of the greatest men that we had, that, 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 that our community, that our nation is gonna have. So it's my responsibility to plant those seeds and to be that spark in the next Malcolm, in the next Marcus, you know, in the next, you know, whoever, um, you know. And so that was, it, it, was, it was like, I, I felt a sense of responsibility, like, because these are our children, this is my community. So, I, you know, once I got in there, once I got over my own self-pity pot, you know, why am I in jail, God, what is this? I'm an artist, ah, kicking and screaming. You know, once I, got, once I got my ego out the way, I knew I had a responsibility because I'm looking at my nephews, I'm looking at my cousins, I'm looking at my sons, I'm looking at me. So there is no disconnect. So, I, you know, just like, you know, you jump into, you, you jump into action as an auntie, you jump into action as a mama. You jump into action as a big sister, you know? What, what can you do? What can you say? How can you speak life that will be a seed that maybe you might not even see it sprout? Somebody else may come along later and water it. You may never get the, uh, you may never get, you may never get the opportunity to see that the seed that you sprouted 
was the thing that got them through. But it's a process because that's farming, that's gardening, right? First you got to plant the seed, then you gotta you gotta toil, you gotta you know you gotta nurture the, the soil, then somebody gotta you gotta water it. I'm, so I knew that I might not see it sprout, but I knew I had a responsibility to plant. Hmm. Woo. I think there is a belief in in longevity, right? Um, and I, w I wanted to ask, like, that's, there's a different approach that Black women or feminists, men, women that don't even know they're feminists, have towards, um, towards movements and towards change. And I wanted to ask, like, what are the feminine qualities of um, strategy and inspiration that has inspired your outlook towards the world, right? What makes us different? What makes you feel different from the way that the world kind of structures how change should happen and how things should be? Because I think that what you're talking about is a different approach, right? Than somebody that's like, we got to change it now. This is how revolution, let's break through the, let's break through the chains. Let's get, you know, um, what are, there, there, I think there are seasons for things, right? Um, and we see that we're in an abolitionist time. So I wanted to ask you, like, what are some of the lessons that you learned around a feminist approach or what does your feminism look like to you currently in this moment? Um, so that, that's, that's a great question. Um, it's loaded. Um, it's challenging. You know, I, for me, feminine looks, uh, my, feminine, my feminism looks like, um, the feminism of Harriet Tubman, straight warrior, straight, you know, planning for, you know, a, a future that I may not see, right? She, she, she was she was setting the road for a, a, a future that she, she knew she might not see. And she was planning for something that she couldn't even see herself in that moment. She could not see freedom. She did not know freedom. She only knew plantation life, but she had a vision. See, that's that, that's that, that's that's that that's that feminine magic. That's that that's that high priestess spirituality that we have to now get back to because we're our own antidote, right? You know, I always say black love is kryptonite for white supremacy, and black love is tapping into our our ancestral knowing, our ancestral envisioning. What do we see on the other side? Because as women, right, we see, we create, we build, right? We grow, we nurture. Right? That, that, that's just how we're wired. I'm not saying that men can't, but that's just how we are intrinsically wired. You know, even just, you know, um, physically, we take things in and we push things out. So what is that vision that we're taking in so we can push something out for not what we're going to see right now, but what my nephews, you know, my, 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 my you know, young cousins, what are they going to see and their children? Are going to see that I may not even live to see. So my feminism looks like, you know, um, you know that 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 third eye. What's on the other side of the rubble? Because we know this shit is crumbling. We know Babylon. We done chanted Babylon. You know our ancestors done chanted Babylon. You know uh, uh, all the soldiers that we stand on. They done chanted Babylon down. And now we in a moment right now where Babylon is crumbling. So what are we envisioning on the other side of it? What's on the other side of the rubble? So that's what my feminism looks like. For me, it's about the envisioning on the other side. What, what are we building? How are we going to, you know, because we, we already in the rubble. The, the, the bricks are falling. You know, we, we dodging the bricks, right? We dodging the bullets. We're dodging the insanity. But that's only temporary. What's on the other side? So um, I don't know if that answers the question, but, you know, I really lean on, on Harriet Tubman because she had to see something outside of her physical reality. And I said, damn, that's deep. That she was running to freedom that she didn't even know or experience. So it's in us that our visioning can be manifest. And that's what I want to replicate. And that's what I think that all us medicine women like yourself, your Sister Roz, all of us, you know, we have to envision on the other side, we have to we have to tap into our ancestral knowing. That's the only way we're going to deal with this. 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 Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I got, you know, I, 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 I can be a real saloon broad. You know what I mean? 
But, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep it PG because I don't know who's on the call. But, um, you know, but really tapping into um, our power because we're so powerful. Our narratives, our envisioning, our, 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 our activism, our community, and snatching the babies up and feeding them so that on the other side, whatever Babylon crumbling looks like, I don't give a fuck what it looks like. I'm like, what's on the other side of it? What kind of stories are we telling on the other side of it? What kind of, you know, communities are we building? You know, this whole restorative justice, I love that. that that's a new envisioning. How can we envision a life without mass incarceration? Because if Harriet Tubman and her crew and them, they could envision a life without plantation life, and that's all they knew, and they got us to that, we ain't on no plantation, right? It, right? it may have remixed, but okay, they envisioned to get us here. Now, we got to keep that baton going. How, we, how, how do we keep that baton going? How do we keep that envisioning going? What does this world look like? What does this country look like without mass incarceration and white supremacy? Ooh, damn, that shit look good. <laughs> <laughs> I love you so much. Um, <laughs> I love you so fucking much. Uh, you can, I love I'm you a too. cousin. Um, uh, I, you know, I, it's, it's this kind of, it's, it's the Philly in you. I want to shut up and I want to give the last five minutes for you to do a piece so that we can close out and that's it. So I, I want you to just do a piece. Go ahead. Do you. Oh, wow. Because it, oh. it closed, it ends in like, it, it'll end in like four and a half minutes. So probably maybe something that's three, three and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. Like, do your thing. All right. Um, mm. I didn't ask to be a poet. I was assigned. A collider word scope was planted in my mind. Then I got anything to write on in a pen. I started channeling cosmic poetry, ancestral intelligentsia from enemies of the state like Harriet Tubman, master teacher of invisibility. See, I be on shit like that. Sipping on my gunpowder tea, electro shooting frequencies to shield me from predatory energy as I sit internally still to focus on where to strike next, what strategy to flex. I know what I'll do. I'll technically remote view you. I'll foresee you. I'll shine my light on you so your bullshit gets exposed. Now everybody knows. Just like when, like when Toto pulled the curtain on that perpetrating wizard, must I remind you who sampled who? I'm the originator, time space operator, template for your digital race. Look for me in a ghetto near you, congregating, activating mystics in the hood, meditating at the bus stop, meditating at the bus stop, meditating at the bus stop while third eye lid lifting, shape shifting to a vision you were meant to see that day. So your time released and planted freedom gene, freedom gene, freedom gene begins to click and fear is unemployed. Warp speed. Warp speed, warp speed. All endings are beginnings for something brand new. So what you going to do? Because the shit is on. <laughs> you put me on the spot. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't going to do it, but then you was spitting, you was spitting a word. It felt like the spirit was on you. So I was like, all right, we got to let you bring it out of me. Cause whenever we get together, whenever we talk, whenever we in this, like you just, you just bring out the, you know, the church lady in me, you know what I mean? The evangelist in me, you bring that evangelist out of me. You know, <laughs> I was like, oh, the spirit's in here. Let me get something out. Uh, <laughs> I want to say thank you so much, everyone. Please go check out Lisa Jesse Peterson's work. Um, please support our sister. I hope that you submit something for this piece. For those of you who are watching, V is for Voices, follow. We have a deadline, December 31st. Go to V is for Voices.com. Um, this piece will uh, culminate in a project that's going to replace the vagina monologues as the center for um, how we organize against, uh, against violence that's happening towards women, particularly Black mm. women. Um, and those who identify as women. And I just wanted to kind of uplift um, for, for Roz. Everybody, please go follow Roz and support Roz. Um, if there's someone you know that's formerly incarcerated, please lead them to the sort of resources that can help them find housing and find, um, you know, oh, it's about to be on, and find jobs. It's really important, especially during this time. Each one look out for each other.